I, I think the homework will actually be quite useful because you'll very quickly learn a lot about about techniques that are useful in medical informatics as well techniques that are very useful for uh, building uh, personalization and recommendation systems. Now, but let's go now back to what we've learned so far and um, in the last lecture I introduced this thing called ridge regression and the purpose of ridge regression was at first to just make least squares a more amenable problem. And by more amenable, uh, what, I, what I meant was to make it easy to invert a matrix X transpose X. That matrix was of size D by D. In most applications, the number of inputs D is smaller than the number of data. Um, for example, you could have tweets and then the different um, car brands that are mentioned in tweets and in that case D would be much less than N. But in some cases like in bioinformatics um, then D could be much larger than N and, um, and, and that's the purpose of that homework exercise which allows you to remap the rate regression problem to one of instead of inverting a uh, D by D matrix invert only an N by N matrix. Um, now ridge is very similar to least squares. The only real difference is that there is this extra term which is essentially a, a diagonal matrix with delta squared uh, on the diagonal, on each of the diagonals. Now the advantage of having that is that that stabilizes the inversion of that matrix. It becomes easy to invert so we can actually do this in a computer. Quite often least squares will, your computer will just crash because if you invert a matrix that's ill condition and you don't use anything smart, um, it's not going to work. Now, we also saw that uh, this solution happens to be what you would get if you differentiated an objective function where in addition to the least squares, the sum of squared errors, we added a term that penalizes for thetas being large. So we're purposely forcing the thetas to be small. And um, so there's two elements to the cost. There's this quadratic y minus x theta and then there's this other quadratic cost theta transpose theta. If delta is large, then we're putting more emphasis on the second term. If delta is zero, then the second term disappears and we're just paying attention. We, we go back to least squares. Uh, for the 2D case, I illustrated this. So in that case, uh, the vector theta has two components, theta 1 and theta 2. And if we just look at uh, the vectors theta transpose theta uh, at the contour plots, we'll see the contour plots are, we saw that those contour plots are essentially circles um, centered at the origin. Um, if we do the same expansion for the first term, we'll get ellipses centered at some point. But we know that the solution, we know that the minimum of this paraboloid, the center, is the maximum likelihood estimate, which is the same as the least squares. And that's when delta is zero, when we don't have this term. And then I also argued that as delta goes to infinity, the thetas go to zero. And that all solutions have to be in these points at which the two contour plots are tangent to each other. And because I went through an argument w that if I were to deviate without increasing, say, the red cost, the blue cost would increase and vice versa. And that's why in your, in, when you do your homework, you'll see that as you increase delta, the thetas will go to zero. Now, that actually turns to be very useful because if you're trying to predict whether a patient will recover from um, her genes, and she has 20,000 genes that you're using to, to make that prediction, um, it might be that only two of those genes actually matter. And if you make the other gene, the coefficients of the other genes go to zero automatically, you'll actually discover which are the two genes that matter for making a prediction. In other words, If I have that my prediction for I 
uh, where yi is patient i, the i patient, that could be the, um, I'm going to make it a, a prediction, which is basically the vector of genes times theta, which will be, say, gene 1 times, um, whoops, gene 1 times theta 1 plus gene 2 times theta 2 plus gene 3 times theta 3 plus dot 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 plus gene 20,000 times uh, theta 20,000. So if I have a linear regression model with 20,000 thetas and 20,000 inputs, if a lot of these thetas go to zero and some of these thetas go to zero faster than other thetas, I might end up having a situation where I say, let's say that theta 2 goes to zero, this guy goes to zero, everything here goes to zero, and maybe the only things that survive are theta 20,000 and theta 1. In that case, I know that only gene 1 and gene 20,000 matter. And I don't need to measure all the other genes. So if I know, and in addition, because I know that those are the genes that matter, if I'm going to do an experiment, I know now my experiment will be about gene 1 and gene 20,000. Because those seem to be the two genes that are involved in whether the patient recovers or not. I do not know the causation here. I do not know that those genes would cause the patient to recover or not, but I do know that there's a correlation between those gene 1, gene 20,000, and the success rate of, say, the patient recovering with the treatment. Uh, how, how would you know beforehand that these values are serious? Sorry? How would you know beforehand that the theta 2 or theta 3 are zeros? Oh, okay, so that's what the regularizer will do. When I have a regularizer, some of these thetas will go to zero at a faster rate than other thetas. So imagine, um, I'm going to just accentuate that plot a little bit more. If my plot were a bit more like this, so the same plot as what I have there, but What would happen is that the curve, the regularization curve, would be something like this. So this theta, this one here, theta 2, is going to 0 at a much faster rate than theta 1. So some thetas will go to 0 at a much faster rate. So it might be, I still have an open question, which is how to choose delta. But it might be that I will find that the optimal delta is to choose this point here. At that value, theta 2 will be almost 0. So I could ignore theta 2 and focus on theta 1. Later, we will learn a technique called the lasso, which will actually make it exa theta 2 exactly 0, which will be much more aggressive in selecting. Um, but it will, everything will be based on the same idea that we have here. But already here we see that if I were to choose this value of delta, then I could basically ignore theta 2 and just use theta 1. So that's essentially the idea of the regularizer. The regularizer is not only going to allow us to invert that matrix, but will also allow us to identify which are the important variables. Um, when you're classifying web pages, um, you're trying, suppose you're trying to tag web pages automatically. Um, you might have the whole set of words that appear in the web page as features, um, but also the, the words that appear in the web pages that point to the web page that you're looking at. So you still have a very large set of features, thousands of features. And there it will be also be very important to select the most relevant features in order to assign a label to the web page. And so these techniques are, uh, happen to be useful there too. All right, so 
essentially, and this is another way to visualize it, where if we have eight thetas corresponding to different uh, variables, different x's, um, and this is actually what you get to do in your homework, um, you'll see that some of those thetas go to zero at a quicker rate than others. Um, with, with rich, it's not going to be really easy to get rid of some variables. Um, but we're going to modify the regularizer and essentially sort of getting ahead of myself here. Instead of using an L2 regularizer, we'll use an L1 uh, regularizer, which is sum of absolute values of the thetas. And that will actually give us a path that goes straight to zero for some of the thetas. That will come in, four lect in, in five lectures. OK, so the other thing that we covered was how to do nonlinear regression um, and how you can take a nonlinear regression problem and massage it a bit and still get a linear regression problem. And so that was where we, where we were at the end of the last lecture. Um, I'll come to the question of how to estimate delta very soon. Um, but let, let's look at the nonlinear case. Um, so I argue that if you have data that is, for example, distributed according to a quadratic um, curve, what you could do is construct a model that is quadratic. In other words, that where you would have x and you would have x squared as well. But then what we do to make this still be a linear model is we construct this vector phi. And in that vector phi, we place 1x and x squared. Because the transformation here is a transformation of the input. It's not a transformation of the thetas. And if we do that, we can still write this as a linear model, y equal basically phi times theta. So instead of we replace the x by a phi, that's all we're doing. And now we can do um, nonlinear models. Um, and we can do, of course, we can do this in 2D and higher dimensions. And um, again, the idea of using a regularizer will be that in some of this, when you have a very high order polynomial, we will be able to set some of those thetas to zero. So when delta is very small, and this is actually an experiment with real data, when delta is very small, you will get functions, you get this, the polynomial is very flexible. When delta is the right value, we'll get a nice polynomial. And if delta is too large, if our penalty is too large, then we're basically getting rid of too many thetas. So getting rid of thetas when you have this polynomial is basically allowing us to discover the right model for the data. And in machine learning, we do this often. We parameterize the problem with thousands or millions of parameters. We put regularizers, and those regularizers is, will essentially allow us to discover the right model structure. So the only thing left is how to learn those regularizers from data. As another example, um, I introduced this radial basis functions, which is very popular in graphics, very popular in numerical computation. And the idea of an RBF is that you put a basis function, or also known as a kernel, um, in some location, um, like in this example, I was putting an RBF that happened to be a Gaussian at locations 1, 2, and 4, as illustrated by the red curves here. And if I add these red curves together and scale them appropriately, I get the green curve. So if I want to create an arbitrary smooth curve, all I need to do is add basis functions. So think of basis functions as bricks, bricks that you can change the size, the width, the height. If you have bricks that you can change the size, you can build anything. You can build the Empire State Building, you can build this building, you can build uh, cathedrals, etc. And so basis functions, the idea of basis functions is essentially that. They're, they're small bricks that allow you to build larger functions. Just by using the operations of scaling by multiplying by theta and addition. Um, and so 
if we put all the basis functions in a vector phi, then we can still write this as a linear system y equal phi times theta. And uh, again, we could apply regularization. So I added to the slide uh, the derivation that I had asked you to do in the last five minutes in the last class and that I did on the board, where essentially here I go stepwise. So in phi, I add the basis functions. Um, I would have, in this case, four, th four theta values, four parameters. So that's my vector theta. Um, I can construct the matrix phi just like I constructed the matrix big X with all my uh, vectors phi. And then I can solve for it either by doing the least squares or the ridge estimator, just like we did with X. So essentially, all we're doing is a renaming of x. So we're just doing a transformation of the x, calling it phi, and, but everything else is still the same. So the point being that if you have radial basis functions or if you have polynomials, um, the problem of learning is still a linear problem. Even though you can tackle nonlinear problems, the, 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 the computation, the solution is still the same. And that turns out to be very useful because we know how, if we know how to do one, we can do many problems. OK, and so, so that's where we were. Uh, what I was going to show you next is uh, what happens. Um, so one of the problems with the basis functions, one of the problems with the basis function approach is that now I need to decide where to put each basis. In this case, I had three bases, and I decided to center them at 1, 2, and 4. Uh, in practice, you would, have, you would need to figure out where to put those bases. So typically what people do is they put one basis at each data point. So there are as many bases as, as data points in the data. So that leads to a very large, if you have thousands of data, that le leads to a problem where you would actually ha end up having a feature vector that's very large. And the number of features would be just the number of data. Uh, when you do that, what you have is a kernel machine. On Tuesday, I will discuss Gaussian processes, which is a kernel method. Um, and we're going to see how we get around doing computation there efficiently. Um, so the location we could deal with just by doing that trick. Let's put a basis function where the data point is. And that could be expensive, but that's sort of reasonable. If the data is here, we should put the basis here. If the data is not by the door, there's no point in putting basis there because we have no data there. So whatever fit we do there is not likely to be a very good one. Um, and so, but it still leaves open the question of how we choose the width of the basis, which here I used the symbol lambda to describe the width. And so, as you can see here, these, these are three cases. On the right-hand side, I'm showing you the basis in blue. So the top plot, the top right plot, is showing you basis functions centered at the data. So I basically have the data equally distant in the x direction. And each of these basis functions is very narrow. Here I have wider basis functions. And at the bottom, I have very wide basis functions. If my basis functions were too narrow, the fit that I would get on the data would look like this. If my basis functions are just the right width, I get a nice fit. If my basis functions are too big, then I get, uh, well, when you add things that are flat with each other, you basically get something that's flat. So I wouldn't get a good fit. So again, the question of choose, so we had to choose delta. Now we have to choose lambda. Okay. And this is typical. So, go ahead. so the width of all the basis functions are the same. Uh, I mean, that's correct. Different basis functions. I mean, it, in some places, of, uh, in some places, we, we may have uh, just uh, small variances. So uh, we may want mm -hmm. to choose the basis function who has a small width. But in some places, we may prefer 
Yeah. You're absolutely right. We would want to do that. So her suggestion is we should have not one lambda, but different lambdas, and maybe one lambda for each data point. Because in some parts of the data, we need fine detail, whereas in other parts of the data, we need smooth. Um, when we go into neural nets, we're going to start, we're going to do that sort of thing, where we're going to learn all these parameters. Um, if we want to stick with linear models, um, the problem that arises in doing that is that even if right now I have two things that I don't know, lambda and delta squared. I don't know the regular rise and I don't know lambda. And already estimating those two quantities is going to be pretty hard. If I assign one lambda for each data, then the technique that I'm going to describe to you will call, would not work. But when we go to neural networks, uh, um, I will, we will see that we can do what you suggest, which is the right thing to do. Oh, and there's also the polynomial order. I said let's use polynomials of some degree. What degree should that be? So when we do learning, oh, you know, when you're building a model, you start making a bunch of ifs, so choices. And that is true when you code pretty much anything. And uh, this is something that uh, the algorithm configuration guys deal with as well. When people build SAT solvers or problems to do, I don't know, any numerical algorithm, there's a bunch of free parameters. So it would be nice to automatically tune those parameters. On Tuesday, I will describe, uh, and next week I will describe to you techniques on how to, how to tune those parameters. Um, today we're going to look at what is the objective we should be optimizing in order to tune those parameters automatically. Okay. Let's start with the easiest form of computing the parameters. And for now, I'm just going to do delta squared. Um, but the same procedure can be used to estimate lambda. Let's for now focus on delta. Now, this is going to be the procedure. Step one, given the training data, okay, so we're given some training data, x comma y, and some delta squared guess. Okay, so we guess a delta squared. We compute theta hat. So we compute the solution um, to the rate regression problem. Okay, so basically x transpose x plus delta squared inverse x transpose y. And that's the solution. The next thing we do is we make, we take the training data and we compute y hat, which is just basically x times theta. And I'm going to just call it train, i.e. compute training data, training set predictions. And I'm going to put the index here, x train, to emphasize that this is the x from the training date. So maybe here I should say x train, y train. Three, y test. And what I'm going to do here is I have my data, I'm going to break the data into two sets of data. Okay, so if I have 1,000 patients, I'm going to use 500 patients to learn a model, and then I'm going to test the quality of my model on the other uh, patients, on the remaining patients. Okay, so my s data sets, my, if this is my data set, I'm breaking my data set into a trained set, and a test set. The train set I'm going to use to compute theta. The test set will give me delta, basically. 
So y test is going to be the predictions on the test set. Typically my predictions on the training set will be better than the test set because I, I learned theta using the training data set. Okay. Um, and that's it. That's all I need to do. And then what I can do then is I can take many guesses, maybe using some logarithmic scale or whatever. Um, and so here what I'm showing you is five guesses of delta. And let's assume that I have done steps one, two, three above. And if I've done those steps, I can compute the training error, let's say, which is just a sum of squared errors between the prediction on the train and the value of y on the train, as well as the sum of square errors on the test set. Okay. And let's assume that when I evaluate those sums, I get those numbers in red. Okay. So for your homework, home, question one of your homework is about doing this. So since you're going to be coding it probably this afternoon, this is a good time to ask questions if any of the notation isn't clear. Just a question, why, why is it uh, getting, not increasing while you increase the delta, the train error? Oh, um, good question. I, I just guessed these red numbers from my head and, and I picked them purposely to make them interesting for the remaining discussion. Um, but th that's a very good point. Let me show you what you will actually get in your homework. This is the solution for your homework. Um, so in your homework, as you vary delta, by increasing delta, this is the behavior that you will see. When delta is small, when delta is zero, you fit the data well. And that's because essentially if you make, um, if you don't put regularization, this is easier to see in the nonlinear case. Let's do it in 1D where we have X and we have Y. And let's assume that we have um, several points that we want to fit. Okay. Now, actually let's put this, let's make a game out of this. I'm going to fit three models here and you guys will tell me which one you like. Model one. Model two. A linear regression. Model two is a quadratic. Model three, very high order polynomial. <coughs> All right, so we have different polynomials that we're fitting to the data. And this is the training data. Um, or rather, I mean, these are the running variables. And each of these guys is um, a point in the training data. So x train, y train. And let's say that it's the ith point in the training data set. 
How many people like Model 2? Model 3. Model 1. All right. Now comes the next day, the next morning. New test data appears. So you collect, it, you collect new data. And the next day you observe the following thing. Now that could happen. And that does happen sometimes. Learning is not a, is an ill-posed problem. And what I mean by that is that it's infinite solutions to the learning problem. And you'll never, it's an inductive process. It's the basis of all science, induction. And we make models. We see how well the predictions uh, are, how good the predictions are. And we should always be ready to change our models based on the new data that we get. However, there is a reason why we prefer, uh, mo there are several reasons why we prefer model one, why we would think, and model three, by the way, is nice in the following sense, um, except for this point, which I drew badly. Um, the training error is zero for model three. And it's zero because model three is capable of going through each of the points exactly. Model one, which you all liked, does not go through the red points. The black curve does not touch the red points. So though it's, it's making an error. When you chose model one, you accepted the fact that you will never get perfection, that you will get an error. When I chose model three and cheated by bringing the black points, so these are the test points in black. I chose it because the error in the training set is zero. So I thought that's, and that's a sort of uh, typical error of newbies in machine learning. To, they train the models in the training set and they think the one that gives the lowest training error is the best model. And that all, most often is not the case. Most often model one would have indeed be the right model. So you, you have the right intuition. But where does that intuition come from? And why is it right? Well, we could assume that there's noise in our observations and that the underlying dynamics is not really uh, the points we're seeing right now and more of, a, of the trend of more than one. That's an excellent reason. If you already believe there's noise in the data, you already know that it's not wise to be fitting each point perfectly. But then we also tend to prefer less squiggly points to other squiggly points. Let me illustrate now um, the second reason with a yet another game. So in this game, I'm going to draw the following thing. A bunch of points in 2D. So this is an unsupervised learning task. where I just have input data, x1, x2. Now, when you look at this data, what do you see? Any, volu any volunteers? Let's start with you. Yeah. Well, two rings. Two rings. Who else has a different explanation for those points there? That's the data. Clusters. Two clusters. something that should be using those coordinates. That something would be, OK, so, so, so each point is a coordinate. But are you suggesting that the explanation is a bunch of points, each at this particular coordinate? Uh, this means that it's not very amenable. It's at least dual valued in a lot of places. So it's mm -hmm. not a very good thing to use, like a linear combination of uh, yeah, yeah, in that case, you would probably not use a linear combination. 
At, at this stage, I'm not asking for to come up with a model to describe the point, but I'm just trying to, to ask you to describe them. What do you see? Right now, you're the subjects. I'm using your brains are the models. Let's see what other models think. What else do you see when you look at those points? Class, this is psychology, by the way. Possibly missing data. Lots of missing data. I mean, we would have more on observation so that the whole circle sort of fills up. Mm -hmm. Possibly. Let me make this more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> New, new theory, an eye. This, do you still like the theory of two clusters? Anyone? Less, more the theory of an eye. What about the theory of, I'm showing you 30 points, and each point is at this coordinate. That's a good theory. That theory describes that. It's a long theory. To write it, I would need many lines, because I would have said each point what it is. So in other words, I would use a model three, a very detailed model, exactly which point is. Then there is a model that is much more abstract, so there's these different levels of abstraction of models. What's happening here, why you tend not to think of this as points, individual points, and why you jump so quickly to think of these as a bunch of initially a bunch of points in the middle with a ring, which is the word, the word that was used, is because our brains have evolved to exploit something about the world. The world is continuous, mostly. It's smooth. If this is white here, chances are that the thing next to it is white, and the thing next to it, and the thing next to it. And you just need to, need to watch out for these discontinuities here. And that's why those 20,000 neurons that go black when you hit your head at the back, look for these discontinuities, because this is where the model breaks down. So we need to just watch out for these edges. If you keep jumping, we've learned that the model is, the world is smooth. And that's because of that continuity that we've encoded in our brain. Because most of the world is smooth, whether it's sounds, whether it's images, whether it's events of a time, um, it's so ingrained in us that we've learned the right smoothness to fit the data. And part of machine learning is teaching machines to do that. Likewise, if I show you something like this, I shouldn't let you see what I'm doing when I draw, because it kind of breaks the illusion. Okay, if I ask you, what do you see here? Okay, come on, let's play the game again. An X. A straight line and a curve. A straight line and an S. How many of you would prefer a straight line and an S? to a V and a V. See, when I say the V, you actually smiled. They smiled over there. Which quickly, but again, there is no reason why that I should not interpret this as if I'm doing classification, I'm going to put a decision boundary here, and there's a V here and a V here. And this is the, the thing what it's hard to teach a machine to do. It's for a machine to learn that continuity of gradients in this case uh, matters a lot. And so smoothness plays a huge role in, in, in what we do. Uh oh, I lost my uh, slides. And so in the homework, you'll see that, uh, so essentially what you see is this behavior that as you increase the regularizer in the training data, 
your answer will get worse. And that's as you go from a very flexible solution to a less flexible solution, your training error will get worse, but your test set error can improve. And typically your test set error will be like, well, that with actual real data that you will get, where it has a, like a little dent at the bottom. And that basically tells you where your predictions will be the least in a test set. Now, if you accept that the test set could be any data set that is thrown at you in the future, then what you want to do is you want to make sure you predict your model will work well for regardless of which data set it encounters. The test set will guide you on how to choose um, the optimal delta. And so in particular, for this picture, you would pick the delta that's here, and that's essentially the solution to your homework. Um, Let's try to formalize that now with this uh, exercise. So, so here I picked these red numbers more to kind of illustrate the technique uh, as opposed to what you're typically encountering uh, in practice. What you, what you do in your homework is what you typically encounter in practice. I oh. Okay, so. Can you turn off the lights? Oh yeah, thanks. <coughs> okay, but so let's go back to the setup. So I have a training data, a matrix X train, which has which is n by d with all my training data. I have a matrix that's n by one, which is the y's in the training data, and I also happen to have an, uh, the same matrices for this test data set because I broke my data into two data sets. So the index i over the data now goes over the training and over the test set. <coughs> and so what I do is I compute theta given a delta, and in this case the given deltas will be 0 0.1, 110, 15, 100. Um, and la let's not for now assume that they're guesses. And next week we will see a smarter way of generating those green numbers. But for now let's just use guesses. We guess those um, five values. Now for each value, I essentially, for each value of delta, I compute theta on the training set. And then for that theta in the training set, I compute predictions on the training set and predictions on the test set. And in both cases I compute the error and the error in least squares is measured by the sum of squared errors. So I just use the sum of squared errors. I might normalize it by dividing over the size of the data uh, if I want to, but that's sort of not terribly important to the discussion. Uh, most important thing is we can compute some form of error in the training set and some form of error in the test set. So like in this case, the black points are the test set, so my errors in the test set would be these vertical distances in blue whereas my errors in the training set will be the vertical distances in red. Okay. And so I'm just summing all the blues, that gives me the training, uh, sorry, the test set error, and if I sum all the reds, I get the, the training set error. And let's assume that I did that, and then I ended up getting the numbers that I'm showing you here. So then, the question is, which delta do I choose? And let's do this as a game again. Can I get you guys? My three four students participated a lot more than you guys. <laughs> so I'm going to start, I think I'm going to move 5% of the mark toward participation or keep throwing questions at you. Let's just do the questions for now. Um, Let's do a vote. So we have five deltas, so let's put them to a vote. How many people vote for delta equal to 0 0.1? Hands up. Delta equal to one. So 18, 18, 18, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. 4, 5, 6, 7, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, about 35 people. 
How many people vote for 10? Two, 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 three, 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 three. Fifty. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, maybe. One hundred. You guys don't take risk. <laughs> And so the answer is one by majority vote. Um, but now let's actually uh, make this a bit more interesting. Out of those people who chose, those 35 people who chose one, can someone tell me why? Yeah. Or, okay. <laughs> um, so you would expect some sort of uh, same behavior for the trainer or the tester. This is only at one. The others, you see a major differences. So mm -hmm. if you believe this is the same, the same data set comes from the same source, it should be the same. That's correct. So his argument's a very good one, very compelling one. That if you believe the training error, the training data is coming from the same source of, as the test data, you would expect the errors to be about the same. And so you would then like uh, something like uh, one. Now, for the people who chose three, what was your, uh, who chose 10 and 50, what was your reasoning? I just wanted to make one point. Uh, shouldn't that be relative error instead of absolute error just to make sure that you're not counting more points for test error? Yeah, yeah, so for now let's assume that the data sets are the same size. And if not, then we would just normalize by dividing the error by the number of points in each data set. But that's a very good point. That's why we would need to normalize. So the three guys that went for 10, where are you? <laughs> They're hiding. <laughs> why? Uh, I chose it because now I know how bad my model is. Like, if I just take it, if I just try to minimize test error, then I'd have no idea how well it would perform. Whereas now, I got one, and I know it performs fairly poorly, but I haven't contaminated my choice. Mm -hmm. That's a good reason. What about 50? Um, this, I mean, most of the time you just, uh, the only way that, like, that you can compare with data that you be getting in the future is to look at your test error. And you just want to try to minimize your test error as much as possible. Okay. So he's, he's focusing on the test error. The test er error is the thing that he worries about. All these are sort of legitimate concerns. Let me now give you um, a procedure and but it might be that you just got lucky. That was the sort of ideal test set that you were given. And then when that another third data set comes in, which we often we often keep an extra data set out here for validation. It might be that that data set of validation could be very different, could be more like the training set and the test set. So usually, and in practice, always do that. We're going to use, we use the train set to get theta, we, to get the parameters of the model. We use the test set to get the right model complexity, the right model structure, the delta in this case. And you keep yet another data set which actually a better name than validation. I'm just following what's in the textbook that's freely available on your website. They use these, this nomenclature. But I call that the sanity data set. Because you will need that data set to make sure you didn't do something crazy. All right, so the procedure here that's typically used is one, I'm going to tell you about two procedures that depend on how, how risk averse you are. Um, one is you would say pick the max. You first look at the max of both errors. And then, then you choose the min of the max. So it would be one. So that's the risk averse 
situation. That's min-max. Min-max is, uh, is what's also known as, well, in some games it's called as the best response. And it's what you would do to get a Nash equilibrium. Basically, you assume that nature is out there to get you. And you try to minimize the worst thing that could happen. Um, so you minimize the max thing. It's the same example as when you have two children and they have to, and you need to cut a, a chocolate slice and make sure that both of them are happy. So what you do is you give the knife to one of the children and let the second children choose. Because then the first children will try to minimize the fact that the second child will try to maximize by taking the biggest slice. <laughs> Providing your children are well-behaved, don't stab each other. <laughs> that's the right strategy. That's, the, that's how you get the Nash equilibrium, which is half in this case. Now, a different view of risk is not the worst case view, um, but it's the, sort of the average case view. In the average case view, what you do is you compute the average, so basically, 51, and what's that, 10.5, um, 10, uh, 10, 10, and whatever that is, 1,100, 550. And so you would choose among these guys, so any of those would be a good solution. Um, and then you probably do a combination of average and worst case, in which case you might want average and min-max, in which case you would choose that. And so that's very subjective. And then as, as this exercise demonstrated, this class is pretty much half split into people who deal with worst case scenarios and people who think of average case loss. And that bit is subjective. And when you build, uh, and that will depend on the application. If you're dealing with machine learnings to land <coughs> aircraft, you probably want to think about the worst case. Um, if you if you want to take more risk and make more, if you're in Wall Street and where taking more risk is a good thing because it gives you bigger bonuses at the end of the year, you probably then want to take, use a technique that's less. Let's not worry about the worst case, and let's just make some money. Here. Yeah. Okay, so those are the two ways of choosing doubt. And it's up to you to pick whichever you like best. In the case of the two tens, would you want to give preference to the one that doesn't look like it's overfit? Uh, which one? The two, oh, the two tens in terms of the average. Yeah. Oh, again, it's a, it gets a bit subjective. So I picked the 19 because I thought that's, the min-max out of the two cases, but. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just thinking with the training error of only one, but, and then a big chest error that tells me that it's overfit. Am I right in thinking that way? No. <laughs> and the reason is um, for the following. That third data set, which is the validation set, your sanity set, you have no way of knowing until you've seen it whether that one is going to look like the training error or whether it's going to look like the test error. It's possible to design machine learning techniques that do poorly on the training set and do very well on the test set. Just by fluke. You just happen, you know, you, we're dealing with random data here, so in uh, stochastic models. Um, granted, it's much less likely. Typically, the training error will be less than the test uh, error. But be careful, because that's it, the opposite situation might arise in practice. So. Between 3 and 21, I would be very careful in choosing. Sorry, between um, um, 10 and 50. You might collect some more data. OK, problems with cross-validation. Um, so this technique is called cross-validation. It's just one of the most widely used techniques in statistics. One of the most useful things you'll ever learn if you play with data. Um, its shortcomings are that you need to choose the guesses of delta 
we will solve that using the technique of Gaussian process and Bayesian optimization of next week. Um, there's also an issue that is combinatorial. This is just for delta. But now if you have delta and lambda as well, you now need to look at all the possible combinations of delta and lambda. Now let's assume, coming back to your question, that I had a different lambda for each kernel. You would have to take all the combinatorial space of all the possible lambdas and all the possible deltas. And that would bring this technique down. So the, there's a combinatorial explosion. To deal with it, uh, we will introduce um, some useful techniques next week. The second problem with this is that I keep saying, and then we bring a test set, and then we bring a validation set. Sometimes bringing in an extra test set involves applying radiation therapy to an individual. So collecting data is not always cheap. In some cases, some internet applications, it's cheap to do this. In some cases, it's not. Okay, I'm just um, going to wrap up this lecture, but just uh, if you give me two minutes, mentioning some alternatives. So, uh, and this I'll go over quickly, um, but an alternative to just this cross-validation where you break into two data sets um, is to do what we call k-fold cross-validation. And essentially it's illustrated for five-fold cross-validation with the example there in that picture. So the idea is you use the data <coughs> sets, basically the white boxes, to train, and you use the red to test. So at the, in the first run, you use the last, suppose that each of those blocks is 100 data. In the first run, you use the last 400 data to train and the first 100 to test. And then in the second run, uh, the test set is the, from 200 to 300 um, and so on. At the end, you just average all the red errors. And this is used very widely. Tenfold cross-validation is very common. Sometimes people use one-fold cross-validation. Go ahead. What if you work with some sort of, kind of temporal uh, dependence between your data points such that like, the value of that one depends on the data point before? Tenfold. Oh, very good question. I'm, I've been assuming throughout linear models that the data are independent. That's why we multiply those Gaussians. If the data is dependent, we will need to do something else. So we're not there yet. That's a very good question. Um, a lot of data, the, the, the assumption of independence is a very good one for many, data, for many problems in practice. So it's not terribly restricted. Um, so here is the same, again, the situation where your typical train error increases, your test error has a dip, and so when you plot the train error versus the test error, as you will do in your, um, as you will do in your homework, you will find some sweet spot, and that's the optimal value of delta. So the way to compute delta is you repeat um, that, exper you do the whole full cross-validation. If you do five-fold cross-validation, you can plot uh, the five-fold cross-validation for different values of delta, which will give you that curve there, and then you pick the minimum as well. Okay, finally, to finish uh, this, if your model, suppose that your data comes from a model that is a quadratic. Okay, so there is a model. And your data is basically a bunch of samples from this Gaussian, this quadratic <coughs> curve with Gaussian noise. Okay. Let's assume that we use, we fit the data with a quadratic function. 